from Yom Teruah to Yom Kippur, are called the days of awe. Um, it's, a, it's a season of deep introspection, which, by the way, I didn't mention. You don't have to, but it is traditional on both of those uh, holidays that in our services to wear white. Um, I'm not saying that in a legalistic way. If you come in dazzling colors, welcome. I just don't want you to come and go, I didn't know, I feel so out of place. If you want to feel out of place and be like, blam, look at me, I'm in neon, it's the 80s, then that's fine. <laughs> you're free, you're free. I just don't want anyone to feel uh, that they didn't know. So, um, But anyway, so these 10 days are a focus of, uh, it begins with a focus on repentance leading to atonement to Lord. I need, now that I've recognized the condition of my soul, the condition of my life, then cleanse me, cover my sin. That's really the spiritual focus of that time. Uh, they're days of looking inward, asking the Lord to search us, to search the deepest part of our hearts and that we would be right with him. And so the lead up to these 10 days, the 30 days of Elul, are days of introspection, days of sounding of the shofar, of saying, let's get our hearts right with the Lord. Now, as you know, and every week when we read the Torah portion, there is the Torah portion, then there's the Haftarah. And the Haftarah is from the, usually from the prophets or from the writings. And generally, the Haftarah portion uh, uh, corresponds to what was read in the Torah portion. There's a there's a thematic connection. But there are occasions where the Haftarah portion, the portion from the prophets, is, is more connected to something that's going on seasonally on the Jewish calendar. Um, and so this is the last 10 weeks of the year. There's a 10-week period um, in where, that have 10 different, 10 special Haftarah readings. Um, you have three that are haftarot of rebuke and then seven haftarot of consolation or of comfort. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at a portion from today's haftarah portion from Isaiah 62. Now, here's the way it goes. The three haftarot of rebuke, the three haftaras, I'm just going to say haftaras, even though ot is the plural, but you're not worried about that, so... The three of rebuke, they're, they're leading up to Tishba'av. And Tishba'av is the ninth of Av. Av is the fifth month of the, on the calendar. And Tishba'av is a, it's a day of mourning in the Jewish world. It's a day of fasting. It's a day of, of where we stop and remember uh, the tragedies of, that have been associated really with uh, with loss and with the judgment of God. The, it is uh, said that the, the first temple was destroyed uh, on Tishbaab, and that, in fact, the second temple was destroyed on Tishbaab. And the, the Talmud lists a number of terrible things that have befallen the Jewish people on this particular date. And so, the, and so it became the tradition to, on the three weeks leading up to this day of fasting and mourning to have the three haftaras of rebuke. And those are from Isaiah 1 and 2 and Jeremiah 1. And, and to remember, to look back and go, look, 586, we, Tishbaah 586, when the temple was destroyed, there was a reason for that. Let's not forget the reason for that. When the Lord is saying, look, you're giving, bringing me empty religion in Isaiah chapter 1. I'm, he goes, I'm sick of your Sabbaths. I'm sick of your new moons. I'm sick of your convocations, of you coming and doing your high ho holy days when your hands are full of blood, when you're not walking in justice, when you're neglecting those who are the weakest among you. When That's what I want you to reflect me. I took care of you when you were weak. Now you take care of the weak. And you're not doing that. You're looking out for yourself and you bring to me your offerings and they're meaningless to me. He says, get them out of my sight. And so those three weeks, there's this focus on remembering what led up to judgment so that we don't go through it again. But here's the beauty, is that the seven weeks after the judgment, right, more than double our haftaras of consolation. Haftarahs of comfort. Because God's final word is not judgment. 
but it's restoration and redemption. He does not delight in just judgment. He delights in mercy. And so he brings comfort. And so when you look at these, these different uh, haftaras of consolation, um, they're really amazing passages. And whether you realize it or not, over the last six weeks, today the seventh week, our haftarah passages have been these seven passages of consolation. So on August 17th, uh, it was Va'et Chanan, we read from Isaiah 40, verses, from verses 1 to 26, but comfort, comfort my people, says your God. And then the next week, we read from Ekev, Isaiah 49, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, he says, yet I will not forget you. The Lord says, behold, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. The next week, August 31st, we read from Re'e, from Isaiah 54, 11 through 55, 5. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And you who have no money, come and buy and eat. The following week, the first week of September was Isaiah 51, 12, ending at 52, 12. I, he says, I am the one who comforts you. Who are you that you should fear man who dies or a son of man who is given up like grass? And then 52.10 said, Adonai has bared his holy arm before all the eyes of the nations. All the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. And then, which we've talked about in the past, Isaiah 50, it ends at 52.11 or 52.12. And then the next week picks up at 54.1, entirely bypassing Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, which I'm just going to read through this morning briefly, and then we're going to continue moving. It gets bypassed. So if you're, in, if you're in a traditional synagogue, you will not have heard Isaiah 53 during these weeks of consolation. Who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he has grown by his favor like a tree crown, like a tree trunk out of arid ground. He had no form or beauty that we should look at him. No charm that we should find him pleasing. He was despised, shunned by men, a man of suffering, familiar with disease. As one who hid his face from us, he was despised. We held him of no account. Yet it was our sickness that he was bearing. Our suffering that he endured. We accounted him plagued, smitten, afflicted by God. But he was wounded because of our sins crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole. By his bruises, we were healed. We all went astray like sheep, each going his own way. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. He was maltreated, yet he was submissive. He did not open his mouth. Like a sheep being led to the slaughter, like a ewe dumb before those who shear her, he did not open his mouth. By oppressive judgment, he was taken away. Who could describe his abode? For he was cut off from the land of the living through the sin of my people who deserved the punishment. So he died. And his grave was set among the wicked. And with the rich in his death, though he had done no injustice and he had spoken no falsehood, but the Lord chose to crush him by disease, that if he made himself an offering for guilt, he might see offspring and have long life, and that through him the Lord's purpose might prosper. So this one who died has, sees offspring and has long life. Out of his anguish he shall see it. He shall enjoy it to the full through his devotion. My righteous servant makes the many righteous. It is their punishment that he bears. Assuredly, I will give him the many as his portion. He shall receive the multitude as his spoil. For he exposed himself to death and was numbered among the sinners, whereas he bore the guilt of the many and made intercession for sinners. So that passage gets skipped in all of this. The following week is Isaiah 54, 1 through 10, Kitetse. So on September 14th, 
We read from that passage, for a brief moment I deserted you, but I will regather you with great compassion. And then last week we read from Isaiah 60 verses 1 through 22, but we read, arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of Adonai has risen on you. And this morning we'll read from the seventh Haftarah of Consolation. Her focus is going to be in Isaiah 62. But for just a moment, I want you to back up with me to Isaiah 61. And back up, go to, go to the next, oh, go to the next slide. And I want you to notice something. Go to the previous slide for me. Now notice where the sixth consolation ends. It ends at chapter 60, verse 22. Now, notice where the next one picks up. Come to this week. And it begins at 61.10. Huh. What is 61.1 through 9? What have we jumped past there? Well, that's a passage that we're very familiar with. I feel like I read it or quote it on some level practically every week because it is the very mission of God. It's the very heart of God. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, the spirit of Adonai Elohim is on me because Adonai has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of Adonai's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion. Just pause there. This is the seven weeks of consolation, of consoling, seven weeks of comfort. So I'm not sure why in a week of comfort and consolation, we're going to leave out this verse. Why are we picking up at verse 10? Why didn't we just go ahead and include verses 1 through 9? Uh, you tell me. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of Adonai, that he may be glorified, be glorified. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore the former desolations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desol desolations of many generations. Strangers will stand and shepherd your flocks. Children of foreigners will be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you will be called Kohanim, the Kohanim, the priests of Adonai. They will speak of you as the ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations and boast in their abundance. Instead of your shame, double portion. Instead of grace, they will, disgrace, they will sing for joy. Therefore, in their land, they will inherit a double portion. and They will have everlasting joy. For I, Adonai, love justice. I hate robbery in the burnt offering. In faithfulness, I will reward my people and cut an eternal covenant with them. Then their offspring will be known among the nations, their descendants among the peoples. All who see them will recognize them, for they are the seed that Adonai has blessed. That sounds like a comforting passage to me. It sounds like as, as appropriate a passage to be included in the Haftarahs of consolation as any other. But it's not read, it's excluded from the traditional readings. I do know of at least one time in the last 2,000 years that this passage was read in the synagogue. In Luke chapter four, it says, verse 16, and he, Yeshua, came to Nazareth where he had been raised, his hometown synagogue. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on Shabbat and he got up to read. When the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Ruach Adonai, the Spirit of the Lord, is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of Adonai's favor. He closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. 
All eyes in the synagogue were focused on him. And then he began to tell them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears. The comforter, the consolation of Israel has come. The rebuke has been followed by consolation. The hope of Israel has arrived. The prophecy of Isaiah 61 has been fulfilled. Yeshua identifies himself as the anointed one of Isaiah 61. And this morning, if you're here you're, or someone's watching online and you've been told that because you're Jewish that Yeshua is not an option for you, Jesus isn't one of the options on the table for you, I want you to know that he is the only hope for all of us, that he is the Messiah of Israel. That he is the hope, the consolation of Israel, the hope of Israel and the hope of the nations. That this Jewish man who was raised in Nazareth, who returned and went to the synagogue as was his custom, unrolled the scroll and said, today this has been fulfilled. And then he lived a life. He lived a life that was never once marked by self-centeredness, never once marked with sin, with me-firstness. That he did not live to take, but he poured out entirely. That he, in fact, was the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 that we just read about. He was cut off from the land of the living, making himself an offering for guilt. And as a result, he has offspring, those who believe and he, who see, and he sees long life. Because even though he was cut off from the land of the living, he has risen. He is the hope of Israel and the world. And again, before you dismiss the possibility, just ask yourself, why? Why is this passage, Isaiah 61, 1 through 9? I mean, it's not like we're wanting to keep the readings short, right? It goes Isaiah 61, 10 through 63 something. I mean, we, that's a big chunk of passage. Why have we left out those nine verses? Why is that wanting to be not touched. By the way, just so you know, uh, in a couple of weeks, the, read, the Haftarah reading is in Jeremiah chapter 34. Or 31, excuse me. Jeremiah 31, verses 1 to 20. It stops at verse 20. It doesn't press on to verse 31, where it says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers. I'll write my law on their hearts. That one is like, eh, this causes too much confusion. So these passages that point to Yeshua are, in, are left out of the regular readings. So you can spend your whole life being as devout as you want to be and never having heard these passages proclaimed in the place of worship. This morning, we're going to just briefly look at this passage in Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62, verse 1. And the first thing that we're going to see is that the Lord, that the Lord your God is relentless in his pursuit to make you his. Messiah will not be silent. He will not rest. Verse 1 says, Isaiah 62, verse 1. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness shines out brightly and her salvation as a blazing torch. It says, for, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. The verb applies as much to actions as to words. It says, I will not rest. I will not be still. I will not be inactive. Combined, the phrase communicates that the person speaking here, the person speaking in Isaiah 62 is the one from Isaiah 61 who says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's the same speaker. And he says, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent and I will not be inactive. This anointed one, the Mashiach, will give himself to ceaseless intercession. He will not be silent. He will give himself to ceaseless prayer and ceaseless action. He won't stop. I won't quit praying. I won't quit acting and quit moving until her righteousness shines out br uh, brightly, until her salvation, like a blazing torch. Yeshua is committed to the righteousness and the salvation 
of Israel. The one who identified himself as the, uh, with Isaiah 61 says, I will be relentless in pursuit of your being made right, of you being rescued, of you, your salvation, of you being made new and whole. That which we cannot do on our own, that which we, we cannot obtain our own righteousness, we cannot obtain our own salvation through our own strength, the Messiah, the anointed one, will ceaselessly pursue on our behalf. For Zion's sake. Many people have given up the idea of seeing Israel saved and brought to faith in Yeshua. There are those who consider it to be unrealistic, a pipe dream, some kind of fantasy. But the anointed one himself, the Messiah himself, is relentlessly committed to bringing Israel into her salvation so that her righteousness shines out brightly. So that ultimately Israel will be as she was made to be shining out brightly a light to the nations, a light to the goyim. In Joel chapter 2, the Lord says, rend your hearts, not your garments. Don't go through the motions of, oh, oh. You know, I, I remember when, I, when my kids were little, like, I remember one time uh, Giovanni went to throw a fit and he actually, he was on a hard, he was in a place where if he threw himself down, it was a hard floor and it would really hurt. So he, he ran to the couch and then threw himself onto the couch. And then when we didn't respond to it, kept looking over, you know. Oh, God says, don't rend your hearts, not your garments. Don't go through the motions of pretending like you're broken over your self-centeredness. But truly look at your heart, at the condition of your heart. The Lord is, he says, the Lord is slow to anger, overflowing in mercy, and he is relenting about the calamity due. There are people that think that God is ready to bring calamity, that God is licking his chops, going, test me, just test, just make me, when he's saying, please don't make me. Will you please just, Please do what, you're, what I ask you to do. You're destroying yourself. Would you listen to me? Would you hear me? He'd choose life because I want you to live. I've set before you, if you do this, it's going to bring death. If you do this, there's life. Ding, ding, ding. Choose life so that you can live and your children may live. Won't you do this? And he's relenting about the calamity due. He's not in some anxious hurry to, to dispense punishment. That's not the heart of God. When it comes to imposing judgment, the Lord is anxiously awaiting for us to turn around and to call on him so that he can relent, so he can abandon the plans for judgment. He is ready to relent when it comes to judgment. But when it comes to the pursuit of his people, he is relentless. He will not abandon. He will not give up. For Zion's sake, he will be ceaseless in his pursuit pursuit. Continuing in verse 2, it says, nations will see your righteousness, all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name, which Adonai's mouth will bestow. It's a name change from the mouth of Adonai. It's not a small deal. It never has been. This new name, the Lord himself will give you a new name, a new identity, and it will come from his mouth himself. Usually the giving of a new name is associated with a new status, a radically new situation, a new characteristic or association. This is not a name that foreigners, that outsiders will invent, nor will the people of Zion do some sort of rebranding or self-promotion by putting a new sign out at the city gate. This is a new name which Adonai's mouth will bestow. God himself is the one who will identify this new characteristics and will and will designate a new name based on this unique feature. But before any new name is mentioned here, what's the name going to be? The conditions, the character, the association of Zion are expressed by comparing the city to expensive and precious royal jewelry. Verse 3 says, You will also be a crown of beauty in the hand of Adonai, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. 
a crown of beauty in the hand of Adonai, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. This is not an analogy to a crown that God is putting on his head. It's the picture of the Lord holding a priceless treasure in the palm of his hand. It's in his hand. The image conveys something guarded and precious, something with great dignity and prestige. When God holds something so special in his hand, it belongs to him and it's protected from all harm. It's so precious and so valuable to him that he holds it in his hand to look at it, to appreciate it, to gaze upon it. What a difference from when the days God had to turn away from his people because of their sinfulness. That he's going to make you into something that he holds in his hand and he looks at you are a royal diadem, a precious treasure in the hand of Adonai. You're one of his priceless works of art. Have you seen this one? Here comes the name change for the people of Israel, for the land of Israel. And this is what the Lord is relentlessly pursuing. No longer will you be termed, will you be called forsaken. No longer your land called or termed desolate. Instead, your new name, you will be called my delight is in her. And your land married. For Adonai delights in you and your land will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over a bride, so your God will rejoice over you. The people of Israel no longer will be called forsaken. The land no longer desolate. Israel has earned a reputation, a reputation of being forsaken, of being of the land being desolate. The nations around them mocked them. They had become a laughingstock. Why were they forsaken? Why was the land desolate? Not because they had forsaken God, or not because God had forsaken them, but because they had forsaken God. They had forsaken God. They had abandoned God. These insults were not somehow unfair. The nation saying, you are forsaken, your land has been, is desolate, they were not unfair insults from surrounding nations. This was a well-earned reputation. They were not being slandered. This was the reality. But here's the thing. The Lord is not saying, you know what? I'm going to make you righteous and I'm going to save you, but I'm going to keep reminding you of what a pathetic wreck you were how unworthy you were. I'll never let you forget. He rather says your past is gone. You're no longer. You're no longer forsaken. Your new name is my delight is in her. Your identity is in the fact that you are the Lord's delight. You are no longer forsaken, but he delights in you. Your land name will be changed from desolated to married. No longer alone, empty and desolate, it will now be married to you. Your identity will be inextricably tied to one another. We often say, you know, I've been saved and I'm made righteous, but we really hold on to our scars. We emphasize our scars. We trumpet our scars. We, we hang on to our past and continue to define ourselves by it. We assume that when people who knew us at our worst still see us, that they still see us and call us forsaken. They still call us what we were at our worst. But the Lord's heart is to transform us in such a way that they will look at us and no longer call us by a name, the name with which we were born. No longer by our maiden name, as it were. Right? But they will call us by a new name. No longer will they call us sinner and forsaken and guilty, but they'll look at us and call us by our married name, loved by the Lord, delighted in by the Lord. And that's what will be seen. That's what will be evident. I remember a few years ago, or several years ago now, when, uh, I was preaching at the prison where my dad was a prison chaplain. And I was talking to these guys whose lives had been transformed while they were in prison but was talking to them about the reality that they would go home. When they would go home, there would be people that would still think that they were who they were before. 
and would want to call them by that. But God wants to do something that you, so that you're unrecognizable. You know, one of the neatest things for me last year, last year I went to um, uh, this conference called the Messianic Leadership Roundtable. And, uh, and so many of these people I hadn't seen in, in at least a year and some longer, um, but it had been a year. And during that year, I, had, I looked very different, right? So I was at this conference, but I forget that I look different because I am who I am. And so I'm walking up to people that I've known for a decade. And the look on their face is, hello, like there's a, there's a polite, like you're a stranger, but I'm being polite. And I keep walking toward them and they get increasingly uncomfortable. Like, why is this stranger <laughs> continuing walking to me? Like, it, it, was, really, it was really fun. I, I, was, I wasn't sure what was going on. I just knew that I was unrecognized. As I walked up, I could see they don't know who I am. And, and that's really a picture of what the Lord wants to do in us. So that what he does in us is we're not recognized by what he has tr- transformed us from, but we are now seen new, what he's transformed us into. In case you don't know me, by the way, this is your first week, I lost like 50 pounds and had a lot of hair and a beard. And then, and so I look, I look now like I did when I was young, but I didn't, but what had happened was people would see when me when I was young and they would go, boy, I can't imagine that was ever, that, that I can't see that that's you. And I was like, really? That's who I, that's who I see in my head. Anyway, They're going to call us by a new name. He calls us by a new name. As a bridegroom radiates over his bride, so the Lord rejoices over you. That's how God looks at the people whom he has redeemed. So the message of Isaiah 60 and 61 and 62 point us to the consolation of Israel. Yeshua is the consolation of Israel, and he will not stop interceding for you. He will not stop. He will not be silent. He will not stop moving to redeem his people, to make you his. He's relentless. And so he is relentless, and then he calls us to be relentless watchmen concerning Israel's salvation, concerning the salvation of the lost. We cannot be silent. We must be relentless. Verse six. On your walls, Jerusalem, I have set watchmen, All day and all night, they will never hold their peace. You who remind Adonai, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. So for the sake of painting a picture and going with, because he's just talked about the bridegroom idea. You know, I wanted to, when I was doing the point, I wanted to say we must be relent because we must be relentless matchmakers, bringing the bride of Messiah to the groom. You know, let's be matchmakers, but that doesn't carry the same gravity as the picture that the Lord Himself uses here. That we're to be watchmen. The Anointed One uses a much weightier analogy. We've been called to be watchmen by the Anointed One, relentless watchmen, all day, all night. They will never stay quiet, never hold their peace, just like him. He will not keep silent, neither must the watchman. He will not rest. So he says, you take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest. People say, yeah, don't rock the boat. Don't talk about your faith. Don't talk about Yeshua. It makes people uncomfortable. It upsets people. Don't talk about God. Don't talk about sin and redemption. It's destabilizing. It makes people feel uneasy. Just smile and wave, boys. Keep your faith to yourself. That's polite. But the picture here is of watchmen on the walls. Why did cities have walls? They had walls for security, for protection from enemies and invaders. Why did walls have watchmen? Because invaders... And enemies are relentless. Enemies wait for moments of vulnerability. And they look for opportunistic openings to invade. That's the way the enemy looks at you and me. It waits for when you're weak, when you're tired, or when you're feeling overconfident. Looks for that window, for that crack in the wall. Walls without watchmen are useless. 
A wall without a watchman is useless. It may provide some protection at first, but only for a little while. Unguarded walls will most certainly be breached. When a watchman sees a problem, if you're on the wall and you see an enemy coming, you have a responsibility to sound the alarm. Hey! Hey! There's a problem. If they don't, if the watchmen say nothing, if they just keep their mouths shut, people in the city will die. You may look down in the city and go, boy, everybody looks so happy and comfortable. I see this army coming, but they're having such a good day. What a beautiful day. I don't want to ruin their day. I don't want to make them uncomfortable. So I'm going to let them enjoy the last five minutes of their lives? No, I have to be willing to make them uncomfortable because I see a threat coming that they don't know is coming. I have a responsibility to speak about what is coming. One of the most powerful messages in the scriptures concerning the call to be watchmen was given to the prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel 33. The word of Adonai came to me, verse 1, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, suppose the people of the land take a man from among them and set him as their watchman. If when he sees the sword coming upon the land, he sounds the shofar and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the shofar but ignores the warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own head. He heard the sound of the shofar. He ignored the warning. His blood will be on himself. However, if if he had taken warning, he would have saved his soul. But if the watchman sees the sword come and does not sound the alarm, does not blow the shofar, the people are not warned. Then the sword does come and takes a person from among them. He is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. You, son of man, I have set you as a watchman for the house of Israel. When you hear the word of my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, wicked one, you will surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked about his way. That wicked one will die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. If you warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and he does not turn from his way, then he will die in his iniquity, but you have saved your soul. You, son of man, say to the house of Israel, you have said, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we are pining away in them. So how can we live? Say to them, as I live, it is a declaration of Adonai. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Do you hear that? As I live, the Lord says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Return, return from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? The watchman, you and I, to whom the Lord has given his word, have a responsibility to declare his word to the lost. The watchman is not responsible for the action of the hearer. The job is threefold. Watch, see the threat, sound the alarm. We don't get to stay silent. We don't get the option of keeping our peace and not making waves. If you've been here long enough, then you know that I'm not, you cannot, you cannot misinterpret me to be saying that we should go out there and haphazardly deal with people in an angry, judgmental, fire is coming, and we can't wait to see you burn up in it attitude. That is not the heart of God. That is not his, the heart of God is anxious to relent from judgment. Look at the message to Ezekiel. The Lord says, As I live, does he live? The Lord is life and love. He is defined by life. And so the very 
being, his very being, as I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I have no delight in the death of the wicked. My delight is that the wicked would turn from their way and live. Return. Return. Turn from your evil, from your selfish ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Turn to your God who loves you. That's the mass message with which we've been entrusted. That's the plea of God to his people. And in the New Covenant scriptures in 2 Corinthians, Paul reiterates the same idea. He says, in Messiah, God was reconciling himself, the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has entrusted with us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore ambassadors for Messiah as though God were making his appeal through us. We beg you, we implore you on behalf of Messiah, be reconciled to God. He made the one who knew no sin to become a sin offering on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is the plea of God. We are to plea on God's behalf. So, so the job of an ambassador is not to just go with the message, the technical words of his leader, but to express the heart of the leader, to characterize the heart of the leader. Here's what he desires. When we go to people with a message of love, with a message of God's love, but what is coming from us is a, I, I hope you burn mentality. Listen, that's what people feel all the time. That's what they receive regularly from people coming in the name of Yeshua. Who say love with their lips, but what is coming from them is anything but the love of God. And then you have another group of people who are out there going, love, 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 and everything's okay, and there's no invaders coming in, and don't you just, just relax and enjoy and, and maybe not with this accent. Maybe they're saying it like this, you know. <laughs> and, you know, hey, you, you fine. Don't worry about it. You know, just stay, relax, enjoy. Nobody's coming. <laughs> you know, I don't want you to pin this message on any one particular person. I'm saying there's people out there that withhold, that preach love, but they're withholding the truth of God's love. And love would be, hey, there's a, there's a problem. There's a problem. Because I care. Because I care because I want you to live. Wake up that you might live. I don't want to see you die. They're coming. Now people go, ah, shut up. Leave us alone. It's a beautiful day. All right. But we have to declare the message of God with the heart of God, not one or the other. We don't get to be lazy about it, by the way. We don't get to go, you know, I don't really care if they get the heart of God. I said it and that's fine. No, stop. We need to become like him and love like he loves and care like he cares and be concerned about the condition of the wicked, of those who are so blinded by their own self-centeredness that they don't know that their destruction is upon them. Our hearts should break over that. I mean, that's what we've been talking about, right? Being trained to be like him, becoming like him, not just doing what he does, but becoming like him in character so that we love like he loves, that we delight in what he delights in, that we think like he thinks, and we're so far from that, but becoming that. Becoming that. The Lord calls us to that. The ship is sinking. This way to the exits Follow me. Silent watchmen are guilty of spiritual negligent homicide. That's what Ezekiel, the Lord says to Ezekiel. If I tell you to say it, say it and say it with my heart. If you do, and they receive it, See, we have to say it so that we want them to receive it. You know what I mean? Like if you go, if you're, on the, if you're a watchman and you go, warning, hey, there's an enemy coming. Right? 
I don't really want them to hear the message. I don't really care. But now I've said it. I said it, so it's off my neck. In the same way, if you and I go to people and we go, listen, turn or burn, sinner. (laughs) You may as well have said, Because they're not going to hear what you just said. They don't go, please tell me more. I'm cut to the quick. Tell me more about this loving God of yours. We're supposed to love like he loves and care like he cares. And bring his word to them in a way that they can hear the truth of it. Never twisting the truth of it. Always coming with the whole truth. But he is abounding in truth and he is abounding in in, in chesed, in love and faithfulness and covenant loyalty so that we would be abounding in those things. You who remind Adonai, it says, take no rest for yourselves, I'm almost done, and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. In language that we probably wouldn't have dared to use, we're, we're told that our prayers are to give God no rest. Now, this does not somehow suggest that God might forget some aspect of his promises. It simply expresses to the audience that urgent communication, coordination, and action are taking place within the royal divine throne room. This is God's priority. He is taking no rest. You take no rest. What is he is on high alert about, you get on high alert about. You get where he's at. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's happening in heaven happen here. Is it high alert in heaven of that you want to see the lost come? Then I want to keep reiterating to you. What you, you've reminded me to remind you. That's what he says. Let's keep talking about this. Don't just say, okay, I've given it to you, Lord. It's done. I'm, he's making us to be like him. He says, let's keep in communication about this. Let's keep talking. You becoming like me. I want to see people come to know me. Will you partner with me? Let's have an ongoing dialogue about this. Give him no rest. God has called his people to cooperate with his priorities and his purposes, to be so driven by those purposes that it feels like we're actually having to remind God himself. Again, when the reality is he's reminded us to remind him, just to ensure that we're staying on focus. You ever given like a kid, you remind me, to do this, okay? And that way, they're responsible to stay, to stay engaged in what you're doing. Don't forget, tomorrow we're doing, we're doing the lawn. You remind me we're doing the lawn tomorrow because they don't want to do the lawn. So now I've laid the responsibility on you. Remind me we're doing the lawn. How come you didn't remind me? I didn't forget. I just wanted us to both be remembering. Yeshua is the consolation of Israel. He will not stop pursuing you. He is relentless. He is relentless in interceding for you. He is relentless in his pursuit of you. And he has called us to be relentless. Watchmen concerning Israel's salvation. We cannot be silent. And if you're a believer, whether Yeshua is, uh, if you're a believer, Yeshua is your Lord. You've turned your heart toward him. You're following him. You and I have to commit our hearts to making his name known. It's not okay. It's not okay that we're, just because you're on the lifeboat. You know, the story, I've told this story before, but the, the story of the Titanic is that there were, almost all the lifeboats were only half full. And when the, the boats came up, when the rescue boats showed up, there were the, 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 the frozen water, the freezing water was filled with frozen bodies. Because people were afraid to risk themselves to bring one more into their lifeboat. The, the lifeboats were not filled to capacity. But everyone was content. At least now I'm safe. At least now I'm safe. Now I'm not worried about those who are freezing to death. The water's freezing, Mr. Ambassador. 
You and I are ambassadors of Messiah and the water is freezing. And he is sending us to the park, to people who smell bad, to people who don't talk with clean language, with people who have been shaped, their spirits have been shaped by the ways of this world in a way that can be off-putting to say the least. They're freezing in the water. And we're in a boat. But there's room in the boat. We must be relentless. He is relentless. And he's calling us to be. Amen? And listen, if you don't know the Lord, know this, your God loves you. He calls to you. He says, I don't take any delight in the death of the wicked. My delight is when you turn to me. He will not force you. He will not take you in a headlock and make you choose him. That's not the loving God we serve, but he calls to you. He knocks at the door. He says, come to me. Come to me. He may, he may shape events that will kind of funnel you closer to him, but at the end of the day, you still need to choose him. He may reroute some things to get your attention. He may reroute you from a place of comfort so you'll finally look up. But it's because he loves you. He's calling you to choose life. Choose life. I got your attention because you were headed toward a cliff, he says. Turn to me. Turn to me. And so this morning, if you don't know the Lord, he says, as soon as you call, I will answer. The consolation of Israel has come. Your hope has come. Walk with him. Choose him. I want to lead, read the very end of, our, of the passage from Isaiah 62. Let's stand together this morning. Verse 8, Adonai has sworn by his right hand and by his strong arm. Surely I will never again give your grain as food for your enemies. Nor will foreigners drink your new wine for which you have labored. But those who have garnered it will eat it in praise Adonai, and those who have gathered it will drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through. Go through the gates. Clear the way for the people. Build up. Build up the highway. Remove the stones. Lift a banner over the peoples. Behold, Adonai has proclaimed to the ends of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation, your Yeshua comes. See, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Then they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of Adonai. And you will be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. You will be called holy, redeemed, sought out, pursued, sought after. You are not an afterthought. Do you realize that? You're not like, oh, by the way, here he is too. Here she is too. No, you were sought after, pursued. He won't give up on Israel and he won't give up on you. He has a new name for you if only you'll receive it. No longer forsaken, you'll be called, my delight is in that child. No longer desolate, you will be made whole, married and new to what he has for you. That's the message for you this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we love you. We praise you. Thank you that you loved us and you pursued us and you sought after us and you've given us a new name. Or give us ears to hear your voice and a heart to respond to your will. This morning, if you haven't given your life to the Lord with every head bowed and every eye closed and you felt forsaken and you felt desolate and you want to be his delight and you want to turn to him and be restored to what he called you to be, if that's you this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you lift up a hand? Maybe someone's watching online. And the Lord wants to make you new. He's not done with you. He hasn't forgotten you. 
He loves you. And all you have to do is surrender your life to him and say, Lord, I, I'm broken. I'm a sinner. I'm lost without you. I need you. I believe that Yeshua is the suffering servant of Israel. I believe that he, it was my sin that he was bearing, that it was my sin that he carried. I place my faith in him. I want the life that, that he calls me to. I want to be made new. I want that new name. Lord, change me. Make me new. Call me your own. In Yeshua's name, amen. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a, a prayer that you just, if you don't say it exactly this way, it needs to express, I need you. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe, put your faith in him. Confess your sins. Turn to him. Give your life to him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. If you need prayer for anything, the altars are open. You, you can come and, and just spend some time before the Lord. We are going to eat in just a minute, so please don't hurry off. We're going to set it, need some guys to help set up tables and chairs. But we're going to eat and have oneg together. Um, but before we do, the Lord uh, told Moses to tell Aaron and his sons that this is how you're to bless the children of Israel. You're to say to them, Yibarechecha Adonai Veishmerecha Yair Adonai Panavelecha Vihunecha Yis Adonai Panavelecha Veasemlecha Shalom Yis Adonai Panavelecha the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And together, Lord bless us that we may be a blessing. God be gracious to us and bless us. Make your face shine toward us so that your way may be known on the earth. Your salvation, your Yeshua among all nations. Shabbat Shalom. Shavua Tov, the Shana Tova. Hope to see you tomorrow night then for our Rosh Hashanah service. Please uh, come and uh, bring a friend, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Shabbat Shalom.